Thank you very much. Let me explain you very briefly why this project matters, why it's important for the Museo del Prado. First, because it completes the expansion of the museum. It would complete the so-called campus of the Prado with the addition of a fourth building. Second, because it will allow us to display more works of art. The Prado collection is like an iceberg. Only a seventh of the, exhibition, of the collection is currently displayed in the galleries. Uh, it's true that in the past the, the, the Prado has known several expansions, but all of them were intended for providing the museum with proper spaces for temporary exhibitions, storerooms, um, libraries, uh, educational uh, programs, workshop and conservation um, uh, workshops. So none of them was intended for displaying more works of art. And uh, it is true that not all of the, of the paintings that we have in the storerooms are masterpieces, but at least 300 or 400 of these paintings are of great value, and they should be displayed. And the best place for doing so is this so-called Hall of Realms, because the Prado owns the paintings that were intended commissioned for these spaces. So thanks to, uh, to Norman Foster's interventions, we will recover a space that it will be unique in Europe where we could, be, could display the uh, paintings, paintings by well-known European artists such as Velázquez, Zurbarán, Poussin, and many others in their original architectural setting. That's, I think that's truly, truly amazing. So I think this is not just a beautifully designed um, project, it's also an important and necessary one. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the Prado as a project is rooted in a body of work on historic buildings that goes back around four decades and is about breathing new life into historic buildings and I guess the recycling an existing building is the ultimate in sustainability, aside from the cultural dimension. There are two issues that I'd like uh, to uh, share, which run through a selection of the projects, which is the journey to the Prado. And the two issues are, uh, as a design inspiration, uh, the belief that if you look far back into the past, it gives you all the clues for the future. And the second issue I would say is one of how you navigate, how you are welcomed by an entrance experience and how you move through the spaces, how you make that as intuitive as, as, as possible. So, uh, this image of the, uh, of the 17th century uh, Prado, taken late in the 19th century, has all kinds of affinities with this institution because it was conceived at the same time. And if we go back in time, then we can see the roots of the present Royal Academy. And it starts in the 17th century with Burlington House. And behind Burlington House, before the massive expansion in the 19th century, was Burlington Gardens. And if you look at the back of the original building, then you see this elevation, which was made at the beginning of the 19th century by Ware. And if we just imagine this window here, then when we looked far back into the past, when we were commissioned to do a master plan, the first master plan, uh, which we heard earlier, um, then excavating, looking into the gap between this early first building of the Royal Academy and the massive expansion in the 19th century, which we can see here, this buried, out of sight, out of mind, was the clue in terms of rediscovering this 19th century facade and bringing it back to life 
as an ingredient, as the entry experience for the Sackler Gallery. So if you then go up in this elevator, you come to the entrance, and of course, in the roof space uh, that was abandoned, essentially, creating this new group of galleries. And again, in terms of legibility, related very much to the primary sequence, which eventually took you up to this undiscovered uh, space. And David Chipperfield's brilliant uh, plan, which now uh, rediscovers this axis and truly connects Burlington Gardens at the rear with Piccadilly at the main entrance. If that was the start of a journey, and I give some examples along the way, then the 19th century Reichstag, conceived by the Kaiser with its dome, uh, symbolic of the authoritarian regime, devastated during the war, and the subject of an international competition to be brought to a new lease of life for a parliament for a reunified Germany. And uh, really, rather sad, um, perhaps uh, almost an apologetic rejection of the imperial past, the grand entry. So if you went up these steps, you would find locked doors and you would have to creep around the side and kind of enter. And all traces of history had been erased from the, from the interior. So again, going back into the, into the past, rediscovering the primary level, the elevated level, and bringing back to life these steps so that at the same time, uh, establishing a radical new relationship between the politicians and the public, elevating the public as a public space into a democratic cupola pavilion to be able to see the surrounding settings of the city and symbolically for, whoops, uh, symbolically for the, uh, for the public. It should animate. It's not animating. So I'll describe it. You go inside and you see the spiral and people are ascending and they look down around a ring of glass, around this reflecting mirror, which is part of a sustainable agenda. So it's an energy manifesto. It's zero carbon, zero waste. And the politicians look up to the public and the public look down on the politicians who are answerable to them. Um, and on the skyline at night, this becomes a symbol of democracy in progress. Another step along that journey is our work for the uh, British Museum, which has always celebrated this grand entrance, conceived in an age when it was a minority experience, and how does it cope with now the six million or so annual visitors? And at the time of this competition, we became aware it was a bit, little bit like a pedestrian Trafalgar Square the traffic, the pedestrian traffic went round and round and round. So to get from one gallery, it was a pretty difficult experience. You would have to navigate through the crowds in the adjoining gallery. So looking back in time uh, and historical research, we realized that its conception by Robert Smirk, it had a courtyard at its heart. And after his death, his brother, Sidney, created the great library in the center with the stacks around. And of course, when the British Library at this time absorbed that collection, so there were no books, and no need for stacks, which called into question all these ancillary uh, buildings. So again, the clues from the past gave the idea of excavating that, revealing the library, gray steps around it, and, and then creating a glass 
kind of bubble artificial sky over that. And that transformation then enabled a central space through which you could move and then at leisure, at will, go to the adjoining galleries instead of having this kind of pedestrian roundabout experience. Again, there are similar themes that run through the selection of projects. This is the original Museum of Fine Art in, in Boston, which started with great clarity. You could enter it uh, from the north, you could enter it from the south, um, and I guess it's something to do with the automobile and car parking, and somehow that resulted in a new entrance on the west wing by Pei. What you're not seeing here is a massive car park to the side. And that completely upset uh, the balance, the clarity. Uh, and so our quest was to rediscover that. So these primary entrances, north and south, had been closed, and the west uh, had taken over with a with spatial losses, a sketch of the master plan which sought to re-establish the clarity of the original axis, again going back in, in time, and some really quite interesting and unexpected consequences of that. The, uh, the insertion of a major uh, public gathering space in one of the uh, courtyards by glazing that over and creating a space which could be for entertaining, for events, also as a gallery space for large uh, scale sculpture, and really a framework around which 53 galleries with a new extension. So restoring that original variety um, and, and, and sense of connection. Unexpectedly, uh, Frederick Olmsted's um, emerald necklace, a great landscape intervention that connects this with the center of, of Boston, the architect for New York's uh, Central Park, uh, had fallen into disrespect, I mean, neglect. The area was actually quite dangerous, uh, particularly at night. And so bringing back to life the, uh, the north entrance here also uh, reactivated a kind of civic pride in the park, and the area has since been uh, transformed as a consequence. One final American example recently completed Norton Museum with its, uh, with its 1940s um, roots relating to the lake, the entrance here, but over time, the emergence, the dominance of the main uh, Dixie Highway. And um, so that original clarity in the 1942 kind of central courtyard and axis, very, very clear orientation. And then over time, that had then uh, grown. And again, the automobile, big car park there, uh, and when you see the relationship of that expanded Norton Museum to the road, to the highway, then this at the time that we started the project uh, was where the development of the museum had reached. And you'd stop the automobile, you'd park, you'd get out, and instinctively you would move towards that door. And when you got there, it would be a little like the description that I gave of the Reichstag, where you go up the steps, except there was a sign. <laughs> so if you were gifted with a compass, you could work out where the south was, <laughs> and you'd eventually find yourself in this car park. Um, so again, the challenge was to take what was there and to convert it, to add to it, to try to transform it. And in built terms, we're only talking probably less than 10% of new build. And we 
rediscover the garden in, in Florida uh, with its extraordinary climate and create a sculpture garden and move the car parking the other side of the road and, and rediscover a pedestrian experience. And part of this new element, which you can see outlined in red, are much needed new facilities like an auditorium, a grand hall for work by visiting artists, the restaurant, and as I said, the garden with a colonnade and a sculpture gallery. Uh, so uh, bringing back to life the 1940s building, the original uh, entrance hall, also transforming that into a gallery experience, creating the garden, creating the sculpture court, um, and, and celebrating the landscape, the, the vegetation. Um, that's had a, an extraordinary transformative effect beyond anybody's expectations. Um, so much so that already we're into the expansion phase. Uh, it's made everybody realize the lack of cultural facilities in Florida and the extraordinary appeal of this project. So if that, as excerpts from a journey, sets the stage for the Prado way back uh, when we realized that there was going to be a competition for the Prado, um, we started doing some research. How would we handle the transformation of the Prado? And so we drew a line around what we felt would be the site. And going back in time, the kind of hollow, the valley here in front of the entrance, and the, uh, <coughs> we realized was an opportunity to fill in and to create galleries, and in the process, to bring the levels back to where they were in the past, by way of example, this is how it is now, and this is how it was at the time before the main competition for this building. And all of this is totally new. It's quite interesting. Um, Madrid has gone down in its levels over time. Not so long ago, this is how that looked. So our proposition was to rediscover this original ground plane, but to put new galleries uh, below it. So that is how it would have looked. And then on the main boulevard in front of it, we had a second entrance and the two would connect below. So this is how it looked at that time, and this is how it would look if we had done that scheme. And at the back, where it's all uh, hollowed out as a kind of valley, we filled with more galleries and created an elevated public space, as it was in the past. And so you would look down into the new galleries. What we could never have imagined is that when the competition conditions came out, this was the site for the competition, which meant that we couldn't enter because all of our initiative intervention, the generator, was the, was the entrance. So that competition um, has been realized, and this is the entrance in Rafael Moneo's uh, project as realized. And then when the next competition the Hall of Realms, which is the subject of this talk. One of the challenges was the Hall of Realms is kind of somewhere up there relative to this. So our starting point was how do you establish a better connection, working with the city on a series of urban initiatives to be able to link the activity here with the main Prado and the Hall of Realms. And so if, if, if this is the main building and the Hall of Realms is up here, then how do we make that journey better? And this has been 
embraced not just by the Prado, but embraced by the city of Madrid. And this, interestingly, is a series of sketches from our competition entry. So we said, well, this is how it is now. How could we make a more generous movement? And so the idea of, again, a very traditional device, a kind of amphitheater-like gentle steps, ramps to negotiate that level change. And then as you come to the main uh, streets, the, the main approach, how can we, you know, can we get rid of these cars? Can we transform it into a, a more pleasant pedestrian experience? And so here we're really at a, at a level advocacy because this was not really part of the competition. Again, it's interesting that our starting point was the city. Uh, how do you bring the city to the Prado? How do you open up the Prado to the city? An interaction between the semi-private world of the gallery and the public domain of the, of the city. And again, when you arrive here, questioning these roads, a multiplicity of roads, they're not really needed, so readdressing the priorities in terms of the space for cars and the space for pedestrians. And this is the, if I showed right at the beginning, the rear view of the Hall of Realms, then this is its real, it, this is its face to the, to the city, to the main pedestrian space. And this has been changed so many times over, over decades, over centuries, the, the big question was, where's the original building? How do we find it? Oh, and by the way, all of these level changes had also taken place on this side of the building. And the entrance, really hard pressed to discover that entrance. And when you penetrated that door, you realize that it was very, very difficult, very circuitous. And all that arose out of, again, over time, the changes of level around the building. So somewhere in this facade, somewhere behind it, is the original building. And that original building, this is the remaining record of what it was, is this part here. So the challenge was, how do we reveal that? And in the process, how do we also create a major new gallery? So bring the most important space, which was, as we've heard from Miguel, the setting for extraordinary works of art. So how, how do we have that as the prime generator and then develop some uh, bonuses uh, around it? And I tried here in some sketches to to get to the essence of the, of the issue. And it was really saying that our research had indicated that this was the original facade. There, the prime space, the Hall of Realms. And here, this very, very difficult route, because originally the levels were higher. So this sketch is saying that we're going to make it easier to enter, to make it permeable, to be able to move through this building without necessarily, as it were, engaging with the galleries. So anybody would take a shortcut through it. And that shortcut would bring them across uh, a cafe, a terrace, uh, protected from the sun. It would just be a great walk through the building. Oh, and by the way, if you then, along the way in this space here, wanted to engage with the museum, then you could go through security and you could move through to the, to the galleries. And that was saying that, uh, that we reveal the original facade, we restore it, we recreate it from the historic records, and we create a generous public space, a colonnade, again, the ultimately traditional historic uh, device, but rediscovering it in contemporary terms. Because as we'll, as I'll explain later, it's also doing something very significant in terms of creating a major gallery for temporary exhibitions for contemporary work at the upper level. So
So this facade then in the transformation will morph into this. And here you can see that original uh, 17th century facade revealed. And, um, and this as a colonnade, as a space, is also working in terms of the operation of the, of the museum because you can, you're encouraged to move through but also, in this corner here, you can also buy, buy tickets. So again, it's, um, it's also an event space, and it's what you're not seeing are the ramps which enable wheelchair access, but also the steps. Again, a very traditional way of affecting those level changes. And again, a before as it is now from this oblique view and how it will be uh, transformed. With the, with the colonnade. And here you can see the slope of the ground and the way in which you can, uh, you can navigate, you can negotiate those changes of levels. Another view of that space. And then really quite a lot of historical research into issues of entesis, how you taper the proportions of columns, not imitating, not mimicking a classical order um, but with a respect for it, learning from it, and endless refinements to finally get those uh, columns in bronze that will age and weather over time, won't require maintenance, uh, will age gracefully. And as we'll see, these are also the structural elements that are enabling what we can see here on the top, the lightweight structure which creates uh, a space of 17 meter, very flexible, 17 meter wide, doesn't exist in, uh, in the city of Madrid. I don't think it exists in many cities, including, including London. Um, so the subject of many studies engaging with Miguel, with the board of trustees, uh, looking at material samples. Uh, so very much a total team endeavor, not just the kind of architect design team working in isolation, but truly everybody participating in this, in this process and the decision making. Incidentally, in the competition, we didn't present the colonnade as only one idea. We presented another version, another variation. So again, it was a very participatory uh, process. So if I just take you very quickly through what the spaces look like at the moment uh, as we move up. So I'll start with the entrance experience. You'll see what this space is as it exists at the moment. You'll see the Hall of Realms as it was, or, or the last known uh, when it was a military museum. Uh, and it's intended, as we heard from Miguel, bringing back the artistic, the paintings, the masterpieces, and the new uh, gallery uh, at the roof level. So this is the entrance level at the moment, full of samples and, uh, and the team, uh, and the way in which that would be transformed. You'd be able to percolate freely um, across through this space. And if we move up to the Hall of Realms, and this is not unlike how I saw it a long time ago uh, as a military museum. And that's how it looks at the moment. And what, it's not, uh, what is missing here, but you can see some of the original connections is the, uh, the walkway, the balustrade that went around. So we restore the decoration and, and bring back the masterpieces which were created for this uh, space. And above that ceiling uh, at the moment is, is really nothing. I mean, it's very like an attic. Um, and that becomes the opportunity to create this very wide, very generous space, totally flexible in terms of its lighting. Here is this visualization, it's blackout because the, uh, the objects on view are light sensitive, but it can be full of light, it can be filled with light. Um, and coming back to where I started, 
I guess uh, if you ask me the best spaces, the most inspirational spaces for displaying art, they're here in this institution. And, um, and they are, they don't have the sophisticated mechanized controls to be able to control the lighting, but you can drop a tarpaulin on top of it and blank out, as does happen on occasions. So this is uh, Smirk's original drawing. This is typically how it might be for a summer show. So ending where I started, thank you. <laughs>